Grazie, Filippo. So our third speaker this morning is John Vollmer. He is an independent scholar and researcher recognized for his publications concerning Asian textiles and their roles within society. He was educated at Columbia University, Harvard, and the University of Toronto. He has held curatorial appointments at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto and at the Glenbo Alberta Institute in Calgary. John served as director of the Kent State University Museum in Kent, Ohio, and was the founding executive director of the Design Exchange in Toronto. In 1991, John established Vollmer Cultural Consultants, Inc., specializing in strategic planning and practical program development for the not-for-profit public and private sector clients. The company is noted for its specialized work with collections of textiles and decorative arts and for developing insightful and accessible museum exhibitions. John is author of nearly 40 museum exhibition catalogs. Vollmer's 2003 publication, Silk for Thrones and Altars, Chinese Costumes and Textiles from the, from the Liao through the Qing Dynasty, described 77 textiles from the Sam and Myrna Miners collection. And he is the contributor, one of the contributors to the catalog um, for textiles in the collection. And I ask you to join me in welcoming him today to speak to us about silk. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to um, be the last speaker about the collection specifically. Um, and I should just sort of dive into it. I'm going to talk about silk. I'm going the wrong direction, excuse me. There we go. And I want, it's really based upon almost two decades of studying and thinking about and at times writing about the Myers collections of Chinese textiles. One of the parts of this collection or this aspect of the collection is not all of it is on show in this exhibition. Some of it has gone to live elsewhere in the intervening years. So I'm going to talk about some of those pieces as well. First of all, meeting Sam and Myrna Myers in June of 1995, waiting for the Star Ferry in Hong Kong on the Kowloon side, was a remarkable um, event in my life. Um, somehow Myrna and Sam were slightly behind me in a queue waiting to get onto the ferry. And I don't quite remember who I was talking to, but suddenly Myrna comes up and says, are you John Vollmer? Um, I bought your catalog when we started looking at Chinese textiles. The catalog was written in 1977. Um, so they sort of knew who I was, and I had no idea who they were. I soon learned they were two Americans who lived in Paris, and the following winter I happened to be in Paris with Krishna Bibu's collection, so I stopped by to see Myrna in her shop. And that started a discussion which went on for years. We never stopped talking about Chinese textiles. In 2000, I was actually commissioned to write the third of those catalogs that Sam and Myrna published. Um, but it wasn't until 2002 that I made a detailed study of this collection. And as you will note, we are on now the first floor, the second floor in North American parlance of the Myers home outside of Paris. We are in their bedroom because that was the largest available surface to look at the textiles which were also stored on that floor. I want to actually do more than talk about the Myers collections. I want to kind of back up and talk a bit about silk, which I will do in a minute. But the purpose of this talk is really to talk about silk and China and how silk, like jade, is sort of fundamental to an understanding of that culture. And the second part I really want to stress is how it was part of the international reach of Chinese culture to the world. 
So we seldom think about silk in terms of um, what an important and rather mysterious commodity it was. Nowadays, silk is relatively inexpensive and readily available. Not always the case. The thing that we don't realize is that it's unlike any other fiber that was used to create textiles, at least traditional textiles in the world. The West's notion of silk is rather an, an interesting history in itself. At the very extreme right of this 1467 map of the world, which is based on information from Ptolemy's second century uh, geography, we find Serica Regio. Translated from the Latin, it's the area of the Ceres. Uh, from the Greek word sericos, which means silken, um, which pertains to the Ceres, to those people. These are the people the Greeks got their silk from. Serica was the easternmost part of Asia. It is generally considered to refer to northern China today. The other name for China, Xina or China, um, which was used by the Romans, seems to refer to people living south of the Ceres and is considered by many to be derived from the name Qin, the beginning of the, the first dynastic period of China, the imperial history of China. So silk is, the, the sort of the source of silk remained quite unknown, at least in the West, for a millennia. But if we go and look at stuff in China, it's very interesting. This is the only luxury product which is produced by an insect. Six or 7,000 years ago, farmers um, somewhere along the Yellow River and quite conceivably close to that area where some of the first jades came from um, in northern China domesticated bombyx mori, which is the moth that creates the larva that spins a cocoon that can then be unwound that creates silk. The exact reason that this moth was domesticated is a little uncertain, except if we look at the broader version of, of Asia, South Asia in particular, as a source of dietary protein, the larva of many insects is a really good, a really good thing. And conceivably, this was the reason for cultivating moths and having their eggs hatch and their larvae create the cocoons. But one of the things that happened was that someone understood that the cocoon could be unwound. The significance of this discovery is really we can gauge it from the fact that it has a mythological, um, it's a gift. So the legendary um, yellow emperor who is responsible for all of Chinese civilization, at least in myth, his wife, the, um, the story is told is that she was sitting under a mulberry tree enjoying a, a nice hot drink and a gust of wind knocked a cocoon into her cup and she tried to flick it out with her, with her fingernail. And the end of the cocoon stuck to her fingernail and she discovered that she was unwinding the whole cocoon. Whether this is true or not doesn't matter, but it's a great story. <laughs> um, Filippo reminds me of the fact that one of the things that's really um, the radiance of objects, the radiance of material is something that the Chinese adored. You know, silk thread shimmers. And in part, it's a result of the shape of the, the filament. Silk is produced by the, the larva spinning, literally spitting out, extruding a paired filament of a protein, which is triangular in cross-section. And when the silk is unwound, when it's reeled, these two filaments are often separated, particularly if you dip it into hot water and they, they become separate. But they cause light to refract. So it shines. And one of the things that the, the Chinese learned very early in, through its weaving technology was to make a fabric which threw large expanses of silk warp onto the surface to create a satin weave, which was shiny, very shiny. In addition, um, you have um, silk embroidery threads, silk floss, which again can shine. 
So the combination of all of these things, and I will tell you more about this robe in, at the very end of my talk, because it also has very shiny pearls on it. Um, one of the things that's rather interesting in terms of all of the luxury goods that China produced, silk was one of the few that simply cut across all economic strata within the society. It was intimately related to the daily lives of lots of people. Um, largely rural women were responsible for the raising of the, the larvae, the hatching of the eggs, the feeding of the larvae, tending them while they spun their cocoons, and even stifling the insect inside the cocoon so that it could be then processed. The um, reeling, the unwinding of the cocoon moved quickly into the sort of proto-industrial um, kind of environments where you had cult villagers. It's literally an unwinding of the cocoons. Up to 20 threads form a, a thread. Um, each cocoon can produce almost a kilometer of, of silk fiber. Um, ever more um, skilled craftsmen were involved in the, the process of reeling and then later in the processing of the threads from those reeled filaments, the dyeing of those threads, and even more skilled technicians prepared those threads for the artisans who wove them into patterned or plain cloth or into the embroiders who embellished those cloths. Sericulture was also involved a whole range of merchants who helped finance the transfer of, of silk from one step to the next to the next to the ultimate um, end users, um, as well as the bureauc bureaucrats who extracted taxes and for in, both in goods and cash all along the process way. You see, we still have creative spacing on this, this quote, and I do apologize for it. I tried to fix it last night with obvious mixed results. Um, the end users of silk also ranged across all classes of society. However, it was the involvement of the aristocracy that really transformed both the perceived and the actual value of this product. Using abundance of cloths, such as those very ample sleeves on the, these dancers, um, from the, the plaque in the Myers collection, remains a hallmark of Han Chinese conspicuous dress styles throughout its history. This pair of paintings illustrates the subtitle of, for this talk. On the right is the portrait of the Shaoshan Empress Dowager dated 1751. On the left, Francois Hubert Drey's portrait of Madame de Pompadour dating from 1763-4. Both women wear garments made of Chinese silk. The Empress at Dowager's costume consists of six garments made of a variety of embroidered and figured silks. The throne room is decorated with three more silks. Madame de Pompadour wears a two-piece dress of embroidered silk embellished with lace and ribbons. Her sitting room is furnished with a carpet, a suite of upholstered furniture, and some very dramatic red drapes, all made of silk. My study of, of the Myers collection provided ample demonstrations of conspicuous consumption. And as I told you, since we were on the second floor of the house, that's where we, were, we, we took um, take note of this examination table. Um, among the first pieces that we started to look at were two Ming dynastic burial robes, one of which is on display in the exhibition. You cannot imagine how excited I got, but let me explain. These were the only actual Ming dynasty garments I had ever handled. I was trained to note the relationships between construction of garments and the economical use of woven fabric and I couldn't wait to figure out how to make, how these garments had gone together. I announced that I was going to make some scale construction drawings and it was going to take a little time. So viewing came to a halt, the Myers went downstairs, and I, with my tape measure, graph paper, pencil, and straight edge, proceeded to measure and draw each individual garment component. I then, in quotes, arranged them on a, a, a sort of sample loom width fabric and as I anticipated, there was remarkably little wastage. 
A system of slashes and folding and seaming retain nearly the entire 11 and a half meters of yardage that construct the garment. The garment, this particular garment, has a slightly lighter square patch and the remains of some cut stitches at the chest and at the back. The now missing insignia badges, which would once have marked the wearer's rank, are, are what they represent. We know from historical documentation that this is the kind of court robe which would have been bright red. It's the robe which is worn by Yang Rong, who is, host, is here depicted hosting a literary gathering in his garden in Beijing in 1437. The painter Shi Shuang has recorded this gathering in a hand scroll which is now at the Metropolitan Museum. All three principal figures held court appointments, yet only the host wears a court robe. It suggests, or it has been suggested, that perhaps he just had been at court that morning and didn't have time to change, or you know, in, in terms of, of uh, beautiful um, uh, etiquette, his guests decided not to, you know, to, to show deference to him by choosing to wear less opulent, less conspicuous, un unofficial ward uh, robes. Ancient Chinese courts had used silk to celebrate status. By the Ming Dynasty, and possibly even into the Yuan Dynasty, the previous dynasty, the way that you indicated rank and prestige at court and communicated information to people seeing you was through color and symbolism, as had always been the case, but by adorning them with these specific badges that described their relationship to the emperor. So from the Ming Dynasty onward, the members of the imperial family would wear dragons. Members of the civil officials would wear birds. The military officers wore animals. The shapes of the badges also indicate things, things around which were associated with heaven. We'd love to, re re at this point, talk about bee discs, but I'm not going to. Those that represented the earthly manifestations of bureaucratic culture of imperial China wore squares. This type of armor in Chinese is called dingjia, which literally means armor with nails. So it describes the rows of brads, the heads of brads, which are attach overlapping interior metal plates of brigantine. So while this is a very functional piece of defensive armor, it demonstrates a kind of level of conspicuous consumption which was celebrated by the Qing imperial clan. So this, the brigantine is covered with a silk satin fabric with a gold wrapped thread supplemental weft patterning. These patterns feature, feature roundels with four-toed dragons, which we call mang. So the round shapes, as well as the kind of dragon, indicate the relationship of this wearer to the emperor himself. In this case, it's a prince of the blood, which is to say imperial clan, but of the third and fourth um, degree. So we noted these two um, grand portraits as great demonstrations of conspicuous consumption. But they're also great evidence for trade, which is really the second part of this talk. Um, always remember that trade involves an exchange. It's never just simply buying stuff. It's often finding something that you can trade. Trade can be money, can be anything you want, but it's interesting where, what these portraits show us. For example, the fur that trims the Empress Dowager's garment is sea otter from the coasts of Alaska or British Columbia. By the 18th century, this fur had largely replaced um, sources, the sort of depleting or diminishing sources of Siberian sable that had originally been um, uh, identified as, as important for the rank of the emperor. The freshwater pearls, which make up her, her necklace and other, other jewelry, probably come from the Amur River drainage, which was once the homeland of the Manchu clans. Lapis comes from uh, Afghanistan, and the red coral probably from the Mediterranean. 
Madame de Pompadour's dress is made of an embroidered silk satin produced in China specifically for export to Europe. The design of these exotic flowers is ultimately derived from designs of Indian painted in resist dyed cotton chintzes made for export. I find it tempting to only think of trade in terms of China because that's my focus, but we've got to remember that this very far-reaching commerce was frequently in the hands and under the control of others. Diverse commodities from widely scattered sources moved along these routes between producers and users, between suppliers and consumers. Nonetheless, I'm going to focus on those from China. The overland trade was conducted entirely on foot. The domestication of the Bactrian camel increased the amount of goods that could be transported, so up to 500 pounds. It not, that, that animal not only made long distance commerce practical, but it stimulated economic development wherever it, it reached. Some journeys along the Silk Road, um, as the routes were termed in the 19th century, such as those of the Polo family of Venice, were long range, traveling roughly 5,000 miles. But many of the kinds of transactions that happened on these trade routes were conducted in a series of shorter distances with goods exchanged and cargoes reconfigured all the way along the line many times over. Although profitable, transcontinental trade was always a high-risk venture and not every camel caravan made it across. The earliest archaeological evidence for woven silk in China is dated from the fourth millennium BCE. Oracle bone inscriptions from the Shang period of about 1600 BCE attest to its economic significance. Examination of the kind of microscopic traces of silk textile, silk fibers on the corrosion products of Shang bronzes demonstrate a kind of sophistication both in terms of the quality of weaving, the kinds of threads, even the pa some patterning. And archaeology also demonstrates a wide-ranging trade in Chinese silks as early as the 6th century BCE from sites in Mongolia, Siberia, and Central Asia. These are examples of diplomatic trade or imperial gift giving, even bribery. And they do predate the officially sanctioned international trade of the Han Dynasty court, which started in the second century BCE. Perhaps among the most prestigious Han textiles, Han Dynasty textiles, were those polychrome warp-faced compound tabby textiles with pictorial designs in five colors. Nothing else like this existed in the world at this time. The, this particular example was, form, was fashioned into an armband, dates from probably the first to the third century. The impact of silk at the westernmost extension of trade is summed up by Seneca's sentiments. But the drain on Rome's silk and or sort of gold and silver capital were also particularly lamented. Much of the silk that went to the west at this time seems to have gone as in the skein, which is to say it was processed thread that was then woven in the west. But we do have a very tantalizing reference to silk fabric being, in quotes, stretched and um, possibly unraveled and rewoven in Syria. Japan, the easternmost extension of the silk trade routes, um, also received um, Chinese silk. From the late 7th and 8th century, patterned silks were particularly prized and collected by the aristocracy and by major Buddhist institutions. During the 15th and 16th century, Zen Buddhist monks created the aesthetics that governed the ceremonial preparation of tea called chanoyu. These um, gla some small glazed stoneware containers for the um, powdered tea were particularly prized. And as antiques, celebrated antiques, they often were dressed up in these little string draw ba drawstring bags. Um, so that the, um, the sort of the discovery, the unwrapping, the presentation of them was part of an aesthetic experience. And many of these Chinese export fabrics were part of this particular um, cult. 
the processing of silk, the, the cult, Sarah culture as we refer to it, was a state guarded secret that dated back millennium. But perhaps it's not too surprising that it too would travel. By the early fourth century, Chinese um, immigrants in Korea had introduced it into the peninsula, and from there the secret tra moved to Japan. Um, the knowledge of Sara culture moved a little more, a little later westward. By the fifth century, we know of Sara culture in the Tarim Basin. And probably the spirited princess that is shown in this particular illustration was the princess that was sent to Khotan to marry a local ruler. So she was sort of like the ultimate imperial gift. But according to legend, she was so horrified at having to face the prospects of a life without silk that she hid silkworm eggs in her hairdo, um, knowing full well that no barter guard, barter, uh, border guard, can't even say this, uh, would ever search the imperial person of a princess. By the mid-sixth century, the Byzantine historian Procopius tells us that um, silk weaving and sericulture had been um, introduced in Byzantium during the reign of Justinian I. That's the emperor that is recorded to have dispatched monks to the Chinese court with orders to smuggle silkworm eggs away. By the legend has it that they used bamboo walking staffs to hold the silkworm eggs. Um, but perhaps more importantly, it's to be noted that several Chinese servants who were skilled with the practice of sericulture accompanied them on the return trip. Tibet was another terminus of the Silk Road, but the white mulberry tree does not grow at those elevations, so all silk in Tibet had to be imported. Very close relationships between the Chinese imperial household during the Ming and Qing dynasties um, with the leading members of Tibet's aristocracy and Buddhist clergy fostered uh, a, a very active trade and gift giving routine. And some, as a result, some of the most important and best late imperial Chinese textiles made their way to Lhasa. Several robes in the Myers collection demonstrate the reworking of those fabrics into furnishings and costumes better suited for Tibetan styles. The, this previous coat was fashioned from a curtain that were a bed covering that was once probably made for an imperial woman of the uh, Kangxi Emperor's household. In this case, the pattern elements have been cut into 60 components and put back together. They're almost like a pieced quilt, but what they do is reorganize the patterning section so that they, they read almost correctly, but they're appropriate for this aristic uh, man's festival coat. Maritime trade offered significantly bigger payloads. So the camel carried 500 pounds. A ninth century Arab, uh, Arab Dao, or a trading ship, could carry uh, between 40 and 60 tons. By the 17th century, a Portuguese carac was carrying as much as 250 tons. Ships could transport breakable goods, such as ceramics, with predictable success. And then you'll see many examples in the Myers collection of these, and Jean-Paul has told you something about those. The, although the maritime trade routes had been supplying the Mediterranean region with Asian goods from at least the first century, the great flourishing of Asian textile trade with Europe and later North America began in the late 15th century as Western powers gained control of the shipping lanes. The success of these later commercial ventures relied on productions that anticipated market expectations. Foreign traders contracted local agents to obtain the right kind of goods, the right colors, the right designs, um, even the right fabric types. In fact, most Chinese fabrics that were exported were exported as yardage to be cut apart and put together as Western consumers wanted them. This is a portrait of, um, by Ralph Earle of a, in 1789 of the dry goods merchant Elijah Boardman of New Milford, Connecticut. So it includes himself standing at his desk with um, his stock, including Asian textiles, on show at the back. 
while most textiles, Chinese textiles, silk textiles, were intended to be cut and sewn in the West, some Chinese exporters also supplied special orders, such as this 17th century embroidered Madonna cape, possibly for a religious institution or for a donation to one. In 1856, the Second Opium War pitted Britain and France against Qing China. China's defeat led to onerous reparations and concessions. In 1860, when China uh, resisted payment and caused the death of some European negotiators, a punitive expedition was led into the sacking of Yuan Ming Yuan, the Qing Summer Palace. Looted goods were sold at auction to help pay for the expedition. The appearance of these imperial textiles in London and Paris profoundly affected Western markets for Chinese silks. The quality of workmanship imbued with the kind of charisma of, of imperial ownership changed Western views about court robes and, the, and their place in a world of art. It engendered a much more nuanced um, concept of Orientalism. It also turned robes into commodities, increasing demand for different kinds of Chinese textiles in the West. In the following decades, newly emerging department stores were quick to offer Chinese garments and textiles in Oriental Bazaar departments. With the collapse of the Qing Dynasty in 1911, foreign antique dealers flocked to China in search of items to sell. For example, in 1917, Yamanaka and Company opened a store specializing in Asian art, including textiles on Fifth Avenue, New York. Consumers for these objects that sort of epitomized aesthetic movement tastes were varied. Some saw Chinese robes as things to wear or draperies to add dramatic flair to interiors. The identification of Chinese robes as antique art objects changed public perceptions. They came to be viewed as artifacts to be studied and valued as investments, not just exotic curios. During the mid-19th century, museums were recast as educational institutions and promoting notions of, of um, what con constituted good design. Um, there had been Chinese robes exhibitions since the 1920s, but a series of exhibitions in the 1940s really initiated a much more comprehensive examination of the subject. During the 70s and 80s, art markets for Chinese imperial textiles and robes grew steadily. Well-researched and increasingly lavish illustrated catalogs, special study days, seminars, um, lectures, all were designed to appeal to potential clients. In the 1990s, escalating prices caught world attention, and by the 2000s, prices exploded. Little did we realize that what would happen to this piece when we studied and photographed it in 2002. The piece was illustrated in a 1924 catalog by Henri de Jardin Tizac, who was the curator of the Chinoussi Museum in Paris. The decoration of this stunning piece of imperial 18th century embroidery has the set of 12 imperial symbols, ancient symbols, which were reserved, a feature that was reserved for the emperor alone. In many ways, this silk sort of summarizes the story that this lecture has attempted to tell. It is conspicuous consumption on the most elevated level and an example of the most lucrative trade at many points in its history. The labor involved in the execution of the ground fabric and of all of the um, individual embroidery threads, not to mention the matching of minute, perfectly spherical beads and the drilling of a hole precisely in the center of each pearl and there are tens of thousands of them, would have reflected, been reflected in production costs. We do not know why this lavish robe was made, but given its rather pristine condition and slightly incorrect tailoring, I would speculate that it may have been made up into a robe only in the 20th century. It's the type of textile that may be among those that had been looted in the, from the storage at the Summer Palace in 1860, or quietly placed on the art market in Beijing after the collapse of the Qing Dynasty in 1911. But at some point prior to 1924, 
when it is credited as being in a private collection in France, it had been sewn into the robe we see today. This emperor's coat, embroidered with seed pearls, sold at Sotheby's, Hong Kong, in 2006, setting a world record for a Qing textile, $1.89 million. Almost 20 years to the day after Myrna won the successful bid of an uncatalogued sale at Drouot, Paris. This talk about Chinese silk is about one of many stories that can be told about the collections that inspired the exhibitions from the lands of Asia. I am endlessly grateful to Sam and Myrna and their families for introducing me uh, to, the, to introducing themselves to me in Hong Kong and for the friendship that has developed and over many years has been an increasingly enjoyable experience discussing the arts of Asia. What those objects and their collection could tell us. To the Kimball Museum and its dedicated staff in deciding that its audiences would be enriched with this by being exposed to this exhibition and for all the efforts it took to realize this decision go my deepest appreciation. Thank you.